Right, uh, our second guest this evening is uh, needs really no introduction. He is well known to anyone that has got even the most passing interest in cricket or has even just flicked on the TV at any point over this, in fact, over this whole year, in fact, over this last 20 years. Um, we are really, really pleased and proud to welcome to the show one of our great supporters, Mr. Mark Butcher. Butch, how are you, sir? Very good indeed. Very good. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and nice nice not to be on your television. Um, and I thought this was going to be a phone call, so all of a sudden I've, I'm looking back at my mug again. <laughs> I mean, mate, come on, seriously. <laughs> Nine Tech Not Out is, is, is making huge strides in the media world. So, um, yes. So, um, uh, a bit of a day off for you, I guess, um, after a hectic, well, a hectic year, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a bit of quiet time. The... Um, well, season finished on what was it, second second of October, um, with the 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 Bob Willis final, which was it was a bizarre game, really, given that it was over in the first half an hour, really, yeah. on, on day on day one, um, and then yeah, so not not much happening from that. Obviously, the you know the cricket world doesn't stop. The IPL um, comes to a conclusion uh, very very shortly, uh, and the World T Twenty starts after that, and then the Ashes. But obviously, the Ashes are on BT Sport, so there's not much happening. Um, for me, back here at the moment, and I've got one or two things happening, at, um, sort of on a, on a more personal level. That means I'm going to be sticking closer to home for the next uh, next couple of months. Yeah, just mention that Bob Willis final. Um, do you think something should be done about that to make it a bit more prominent, to give it a bit more of a, a sort of a, a final hurrah to the season? Yeah, I mean, uh, the thing is, is that, that initially when it was mooted. Obviously, all of these things have happened because of COVID, you know, because of the way that the, the summer has kind of been interrupted. Um, and then obviously Bobby passing away, so they thought it'd be a great tribute. But what they wanted it to, to be was the decider for the championship, um, um, which it was in, the, what was it, 2020, when Essex, uh, when Essex won it again, when they beat Somerset. Um, but this year, they wanted it to be more, you know, the... the, the the championship to be decided as a league as it always has been and so therefore I say they the counties preferred it that way and I must admit I, I tend to agree with them um, I've never never really sort of understood the idea of a, of a league system that gets then gets uh, sorted out um, over the course of one one game um, and so you know because the counties decided that they wanted the, the championship to be decided as the way it has been always as a league then it kind of was left with this fixture that didn't really have <clears throat> didn't really have anything riding on it. Um, so you know the, the irony irony of that, I suppose, is that Bob Willis would have hated a game like that. You know, where, there was, where it was a game for for no particular reason. Um, but that, but that would have brought out the how... best in him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. Put it this way: he he certainly would have been uh, he he certainly would have would have had a lot to say about it. That is for sure. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely <laughs> right. Um, but exactly. So so it's kind of it's not ideal. Um, and I think trying to find or come up with a way to make that match have some sort of significance. I mean, I've seen ideas written online. Um, you know, people tweeting and saying, you know, what what about sort of the Sheffield Shield champions play against the county champions in, in the, you know, at the beginning of the season or you do it in Dubai or something and it becomes like a charity Shield game, uh, something like that. There, 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 there is definitely a more satisfactory way of doing it, but that's kind of, COVID has left us with all of these weird loose ends in the season and that's one of them. Yeah, I was going to say that the whole domestic season this year is, is just a, a catalogue of um, not perfect solutions, is it? I mean, whether it's the Blas, whether it's county yeah. championship, uh, the test series, um, you know, nothing has, has, been, has, has sort of fitted perfectly into a slot this year. No, it hasn't. And, and I, I, mean, I tend to agree with Athers. Athers has sort of has, has been quite firm on saying, look, whatever happens, it's no good changing the format every couple of years. You have to give something the chance to kind of to, to take hold. Um, Obviously, one you know the major thing that's been thrown into the thrown into the works into the mix has been the hundred, um, and the fact that that eats up all of all of August or sort of the back end of July and most of August, um, then leaves all the other formats sort of scrambling around for a, for a place. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a nightmare that well, it's utterly ridiculous that you've got a fifty over competition that is that is being played by second and third elevens. Um, 
throughout the the course of the summer i mean we're only we're only world champions in it for goodness sake it's, you know why would you bother taking that form out of the game seriously um you know you've got the championship being butted up to what from one end of the season to another um the the, the, the t20 blast is has continued in the way that it's always continued but it's become even more impossible to follow than it was mm. in the first place so yeah, nothing. Nothing is satisfactory at the moment. One, one thing is for sure is that whether whether people like it or not, the um, the hundred is kind of here to stay. And in that slot as well, in that period, it's, well, it wouldn't yeah. work outside of the school holidays. <clears throat> Perhaps it wouldn't. I mean, you know, I've I've mooted the idea that you um, you know, that it that it you have it goes for two weeks, then you have a, a break in the middle where where you play a couple of championship games or maybe one round of championship fixtures or something and then you go back to it again so that it doesn't hoover up during the entirety of the um of, of that sort of prime period but you know again that, that's not that that's not straightforward to do i should imagine um you know for me that the one thing that that that, that is going to have to give is going to be the blast i think um which might have been the the uh, the idea from the ecp all along um <laughs> But I, I still think that, the, that doing it the way that it is at the moment in um, in, in the two groups and that 14, 14 games is not sustainable whilst whilst you have the 100 as well. Um, and I've got a couple of ideas as to how you might get around that while still making sure that the counties get the chance to play the blast against their nearest rivals and still make make their money out of it, still bring in their, bring in their fan. But it can't stay the way that it is. I think that's the, that's one of the that's one of the main takes. Do you think it succeeded the hundred without sort of trying to go down any controversial arguments? But mm. just on the on the basic level of attracting more people into the game, do you think it succeeded? Well, I think it did. Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you there's two ways of looking at it. One is it's a it's a great success. It did exactly what it was meant to do. Loads of uh, loads of more high profile uh, for or much higher profile for the for the women's game. Um, big, big crowds in in big stadiums, which is which is always you know which is always a no brainer as far as I was concerned. You play you play the majority of the games, all of the games in in big grounds, and you get bigger crowds. Yeah. Um, I think, but th there is another way of looking at it. There is if you just if you just spent a fraction of the money, or even a, a, a half half of the money um, that has been spent on the hundred on on advertising the blast, you might have ended up with a similar result. So, you know, the, the time will tell as to how successful it ends up being. But um, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. The thing that shocked me the most, actually, was, was how much, um, was how much the, the, the crowds engaged with the idea of their team winning, a team that didn't exist until sort of like a week beforehand. Suddenly people were rooting for the Manchester Originals and Birmingham Phoenix. Um, Edgbaston was full every night. Um, Old Trafford was full. Headingly was full in games that didn't involve Yorkshire and Lancashire at the same time, you know, and that's something that you know I've travelled, I've travelled around the country, I've done a lot of blast cricket, and I know for a fact that that most grounds will only pull in an audience on certain evenings against certain opposition, but with this, by and large, but, but you know, aside from the, the restrictions with Cardiff, um, and Cardiff is a different case altogether anyway, um, the, the 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 grounds were full. You didn't even mention Oval Invincibles there. Well, I mean, there's no point in there isn't any point, is there? I mean, the, the Oval's full, whether whether it's Surrey playing or whether it's the Oval Invincibles playing. That's kind of that's one of the places that that, that is a that stands on its own anyway. Yeah. Um, and um, you know that was one of one of one of the one of Surrey's big problems with the hundred was well, you know, why why do you want us to get behind something that is probably going to be less less <laughs> less full and less capacity than than something that we do every week anyway. You know that was that was one of one of Surrey's arguments to get against um, against giving the ground over to a different uh, a different team name during that part of the year. Talking of Surrey and uh, things that were new in 2021, um, the amazing progress and success of the Ace project. Which I know you're well, involved. I know with. that's I know that's close to home for you as well. Because Absolutely, a certain, a certain young Mutu is uh, <laughs> is starring and thriving under that under that system. He, he's loving it, um, and mm. he's thriving because it's from what I've seen, um, and I've been involved in a lot of club cricket and youth cricket and whatever else. Um, the approach that the guys are taking, and and huge credit to people like Chevy Green um, and all the other coaches. 
but it's a very, very different and more all encompassing approach to nurturing kids and to giving them belief and making them realize their potential. Um, it's, it's been quite stunning to see, but the progress is amazing. Yeah, um, and, and the fact that it's now being rolled out in Birmingham, now being rolled out as a huge sort of Caribbean black community in, in, um, in Bristol. Um, so great that it's gone down there. I mean, Ebony is a, is a dynamo. She's a, you know, an extraordinary person, human being. Um, and, um, you know, whatever, whatever success comes from that has largely been because of her, her drive and also people like Chevy and, and, and Surrey County Cricket Club for, for getting behind it in the first place. Um, sort of forcing the forcing the hand, I suppose, of, of Sport England and of of the ECB to kind of look much close, much more closely at, at this issue, um, and um, you know, and, and and actually finally make something happen around it, as opposed to sort of paying lip service to the idea that you want more participation and you want the game to be for everybody, but uh, but in reality, what does that look like? Um, and what it looks like is what is what Ace is doing. Yeah, and it's it's important because I think, you know, over the years we've had lots of slogans, we've had lots of T-shirts, we've had lots of um, well-meaning gestures, but have amounted to very little. I think this was definitely a case that it was identified that there had been a drop-off in participation from a certain part of the community, and yep. it's been addressed in exactly the right way. What was great, I went down to that game at, uh, at Bristol, and uh, it was played at the Phoenix West Indian Club in Bristol. And um, what I loved about it, and you will relate to this as well, was it was a real community feel at the club and loads of old boys came along. And midway through the afternoon, little bottles of rum have appeared, a little trestle table has been set up, <laughs> and a domino competition kicks off. <laughs> and it just felt like, you know, you, 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 were, you, were, you were transformed to, the other part, to another part of the world. It was, it was fantastic to see that. No, oh, great. I mean, you know, that's kind of that idea of um, of, uh, of of Caribbean culture and cricket is kind of one of the one of the things that it's difficult to quantify. That isn't it? I made the the, the point in the in the documentary. Um, you guys are history that that the idea of of sort of black guys and, and, and girls in the seventies being comfortable. Um, in their in themselves in the in their culture in in their music in their dress and whatever it was in most most places in the UK was was you know was few and far between, but in cricket they found you know they they, they found an environment whereby it was absolutely it was it was fine it was welcomed and people were allowed to be themselves, um, and so that's you know what you're saying there is exactly that you kind of the game of, you get a game of cricket someone sets up a trestle table. You, you pull out the bottles of rum everybody loves it you know everybody's kind of engaged and suddenly you, a, a community comes comes together within themselves and integrates with other people and everybody loves it and that's kind of it's, it's a real simple simple thing isn't it a simple yeah. idea it's got nothing to do with you know people playing test matches or, or becoming professional cricketers but what it does what it does have is, is sort of like a sense of, of community people enjoying themselves and and being um and being comfortable in their own skin and doing so yeah and it just it took me back to what i was about 14 15 and playing for lambeth cricket club in south london and um playing uh a team called brixton west indians yeah and, <laughs> and it was just a fan it was a, a proper community day out all the the mums and the girlfriends whatever turned up with the food all in the big trays with the fall over the top yeah and then we see some- they'll be they'll be playing now the boys <laughs> will have to bring the food along yeah i know <laughs> And then, and then all of a sudden the transit van would turn up halfway through the afternoon and a load of lads would jump out the back, set up the speakers and the decks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was long before you had yeah. T20 and the 100 and DJs there. We used to have them <laughs> Norman well, Park exactly. in Bromley. Exactly. I mean, that's the whole thing with, you know, like the beautiful old Antigua Recreation Ground and stuff. I mean, that's... Why did why did all of the, of the, um, the English cricket fans and the English tourists... Why did they want to go and watch cricket get cricket matches at the Antigua Recreation Ground or Kensington Oval Barbados? Because it was like that. Yeah. Because you had, you know, that that atmosphere was as much part of the day's play as um, as the cricket itself. Yeah, Kensington Oval, '98. I was there along with someone else in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, there. I was watching watching Ramps make his uh, make his first Test hundred there. Yeah. 
screaming hot day that was absolutely mm. blistering and we were sat on a temporary stand above the sound system it was a <laughs> quite an experience quite an experience um ashes are coming towards us hopefully there seems to be a real will to make this happen um yeah sydney uh, this week just watching the news sydney seems to be unwinding a little bit so uh, and i'm guessing concessions are going to be made but all of that aside what do you think about this side we're taking down there have we made a couple of mistakes? Um, do you think? I don't know about I don't know about mistakes. I don't think there are there are a, a many sort of um, many things that could be fixed by alternative selections. Um, you know, everyone will always have their opinion or their favourites as to why why so and so should be on the plane and so and so shouldn't. But the the biggest the biggest issue for England, I suppose, the biggest area for England is going to be in the in the in the pace bowling ranks. Because you know, I, I do worry. I do worry that that Jimmy and, and Stuart are going to find life unbelievably difficult on those on those decks down there at the at the stage in their in their lives and careers that they're at. And I hope they prove me wrong. So I'll go on. I'll go on uh, on the record as saying that. But you know, had England been able to to, to have called upon um, Ollie Stone and Joffre Archer and and guys guys like that, things things would look a little bit more threatening as far as the bowling lineup is concerned. We are where we are with, uh, with our spin resources and people always sort of talk about Australia as being, you know, it's all about pace. It's all about that. Well, no, it's not. It's all about being bloody good bowlers. It's also all about having, having at least one, well, no, having one spinner who, who you can really rely on at times when the kookaburra stops being um, of any use to the quick bowlers, which is pretty much all the time. <laughs> So, you know, that's an area where we've got a massive issue. Um, and then the other area, I suppose, is just in terms of in terms of um, experience in, in the batting lineup. A, of, of, of playing, playing Ashes cricket and, and B, in terms of scoring, scoring big runs. You know, the, Joe Root stands so far in, ahead of his contemporaries in that batting lineup that you would, um, you know, you'd, you'd be right to worry that faced with, Cummins, Hazelwood, Stark, and Lyon, that um, that England are going to find life difficult. Um, you know, the, the people will point to 10, 11 and that England's Ashes success and say, well, they didn't have express pace bowlers on that trip. You know, people like Bresden and Tremlett and Jimmy, um, and Jimmy Anderson, uh, Stephen Finn played in the first couple of test matches or whatever, but, but Bresden and Anderson um, and Tremlett were the three that pretty much finished it off. However, they, they, they also had a batting like that. They had Ian Bell, Kevin Peterson, um, Andrew Strauss. Uh, you know, they scored a, a, a certain Alistair Cook who scored 700 runs. You know, they, they kind of, they scored a mountain of runs and then were able to keep, keep things tight. They got Graham Swan, who's the, who's the ace in the pack as far as playing in Australia is concerned. And that, 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 that idea of pressurising Australia into kind of making mistakes by, by, tight bowling and, and mountains of runs on the board or what won it in 10 to 2010-11. Now you might be able to get that same sort of pressure. You might with, with the, the bowlers that England have got on this trip, but the doubt comes with, are you going to be able to put that, those sort of scores on the board on a regular basis that they did back then? It's frightening. I think that's 10 years ago, um, but you're right. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> that top order just consistently were just piling runs on. It was, it was, it was actually amazing to, to watch. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's true. Graham Gooch always says, um, "Oh, Kevin, I forgot Kevin Peterson was also in that team as well." So you know, it was a stellar. That yeah. top six was as good as it got. And, and Matt Pryor, who's England's best, you know, best ever keeper batsman in terms of scoring, run scoring, and average, batting at seven. You know, it was a serious lineup they had there. Yeah, and you know they were, they were regularly getting five hundred plus on the mm. board. So yeah, that's it. But but I think it kind of underlines as well what Graham Gooch always says is that. Ashes cricket is is the pinnacle of your you know if you're an England player or an English player, that is the absolute top of the tree. And if you can perform in an Ashes series, then that's really the the the, the badge that you the badge of honour that you'd wear. Yeah, for sure, and and that's why most of the guys were very keen to make sure they were on that plane. Um, you know, there, there were some some murmurings about reluctance to tour if. Families weren't able to go, and I kind of I, I had some sort of strong strong views on that at the time. 
fortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to be the case. It looks like the, mm. the, the dispensations are going to be made and they're going to be able to go out there and stay in nice places and not have to worry about quarantine, etc. Um, but I, I also think that whatever, whatever happens and whatever restrictions there might be on, um, on the touring team and their, and their party, I still think the Ashes will, has to go ahead. Um, simply because, I mean, how, how much more cricket are we going to bump down the road and say, well, we're going to fit this in here, there and everywhere? You can't. At some point, you have to say, well, if it doesn't happen now, we're just scratching it. We're not making it up. We won't make it up later. We have to scratch, start scratching things out and starting from zero. Um, you know, there's, there's, of course, since I've spoken, I haven't spoken to you for ages, we also had the, the Pakistan thing that's just happened and them being sort of left in the lurch for what yeah. was, for what, from, from England's point of view, really was, 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 a, was a show of goodwill as far as I was concerned, that four-day trip. And, um, and they should have sent a team. But I have no, I have absolutely no, no compulsion um, to, to think that, that anything other than a team going down there should have happened. So, um, you know, but that's, this is where we are. It's the, the, the game has changed a lot in terms of who, who wields the most power in it, who, um, who are the guys who kind of forever, forever seem to be chasing their tail and who are the people who kind of sort of uh, are, are running things. And at the moment, there are three at the top who do pretty much as they wish and the rest kind of run around after them. Yeah. I had a rant about this on the show the other week. Um, you know, it, it's just four days to go to that Pakistan tour. Four days. Mm. I mean, if the big boys didn't want to go, if there were players who were unhappy, surely it wouldn't have been too hard. I mean, we saw earlier in the, in, in the English summer when that um, that ODI team was struck down with COVID. They pretty soon found a scratch 11 to put out. Um, why the hell yeah. it wasn't possible this time, I'll, ne I'll never know. I think they shot no. themselves in the foot massively. Uh, and before all that, we've got a World Cup coming up, the T20 World Cup, mm. um, which we are looking fairly well set to to do well in. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we've got we've got as good a chance as any. Um, just trying to think, you know, Pakistan are going to be bloody good. New Zealand are probably going to be really good. West Indies are going to be are going to be strong. Um, winning it is is a is going to be a real shootout. I think I don't I don't think there's a favourite in there. Not even India. Um, mm. I think any one of any one of four or five teams could win that, um, with us being one of them. Now, we just had uh, your good mate John Altman uh, on the show earlier on, and yes. uh, we, as always, with that man, I could have him on for twenty four hours, and I still wouldn't get, I wouldn't run out of fantastic stories and interesting things to talk about. <laughs> but one of the questions I asked him was, um, you know. Given his love of music, given his love of cricket, I asked him about were there any cricketers for him that stood out as outstanding musicians, and was there anyone that really you thought could have had a career in music? And he said yes. He said there is one name that stands head and shoulders above everyone else, Charlie Dagnall. He said. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> oh, jeez. No, he said he mentioned your good self. He was very complimentary and 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 said that um, you know your 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 musical exploits um, stand. You, you could have done nothing on a cricket field and still been a fantastic musician. So, uh, oh, well, that's that coming from him. That's very kind. Very kind. We've got a couple of shows coming up actually, which I'm sure you won't mind me mentioning. Um, Go for it. For the first time since. Well, it would have been since since the album came out back in in July of 2019. So we've got two shows: one at the uh, Greenwich Theatre um, on the 21st of November, and another one up in uh, St Albans at a place called the Horn on the 30th. So any of your listeners fancy getting look Greenwich one, get we'll probably be closer to them. But you know, you're, I know how global you are now. So, yeah. um, so th those two are in the book for now. I'll put the links at the bottom of the screen on the video and I will mention them on the radio station when um, when I get the details. Um, and I should also add that you are in charge of our playlist this evening. A new thing that we're doing is we're putting... We had um, yeah. uh, a selection arrived from you yesterday. So do you want to just quickly just run us through your choices? Without no, any... well, I can't. And I can't bloody remember now. Um, what have I got? There's a bit of James Brown on there. There's James from Brown. The, She's the one. From the Motherload album, which which my my uncle David introduced me to when I was about about eleven or twelve, I think. 
and it's just a fabulous little three and a half minutes of a ton of funk, which is fantastic. Um, what else? Mr. Weller, of course. Yeah, Paul Weller from 22 Dreams. Um, what, which one is, which one did I go for? Have you, have you made have your you mind made up? Have you made up your mind? Yeah, you made up your mind. I've got, I've got, um, I've got Michael McDonald on there. What a track that um, is. I keep forgetting, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've just, I've just, I found this kid, this 17 year old, um, uh, finger style guitar player I think he's Japanese or Korean or something and I just stumbled across this version of him doing it sort of solo on the guitar and it just it completely blew my mind and so I've been I've been spent spent the last waking three weeks trying to work out how he, how he does it and I, I still don't know but anyway it's just a it's a fantastic track and then a couple of a couple of sort of uh, more modern sort of laid back groove soul type things um, I think Celeste is one of them, and the other one escapes me. Uh, but Coco Blood couple. from Celeste, and you got Feel Alive yeah. from the Midnight uh, with the Midnight uh, from the Midnight Hour. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think there, I don't think there are any more than that. But I think it's, not, it's just just stuff that I'm listening to at the moment, really. That's all. No, it's great. It's great. I, mm -hmm. I've not heard that Michael McDonald track for for a long time, and it's just one of those that once you start listening to it, you just you know the quality of yeah. it and uh, just just it incredible. Is fantastic. And I swear, he, I mean, he's one of those, those artists that kind of uh, is the um, sort of epitome of a, of a certain type of, of um, uh, it's not very cool to like Michael McDonald, is it? I mean, even though you're going for, going for his 1982 hairstyle, um, but, but, oh my God. And of course, you know, everyone remembers the LV, um, the LV, uh, what was, what was the name of the thing? Oh, he, there, the was a, there was a, that's it. There was a rat track, wasn't there, that came out? Yeah. Oh God! Um, the late nineties. Uh, exterminate or something? What was it? Um, regulate. That's regulate. Warren G. Yeah, Warren G. G. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's. I bet it's. It's belting. It's actually. It's sensational. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right, listen, Butch. Brilliant to uh, catch up, and um, I'm sure we'll speak soon. But uh, many thanks for all the support you've given us on the show. It's been absolutely. Yeah, no worries golden it really has and um we shall uh try and get that well we will get down to your shows i'll get some tickets and we'll get we'll come down and support you and right, um no worries. Yeah. maybe we do we, we'll do a christmas lunch or something i don't know now you're talking now you're talking shall i bring my drumsticks yeah well yeah well chicken <laughs> <laughs> bob butcher many many thanks and uh we look forward to catching up soon all right speak soon bye Thank mm -hmm. you.